Hello and welcome to our um, summit today. Um, I am on the education committee and um, I'm always telling people to tell their stories um, and I sit in the corner and don't tell my own. Um, so this is the first time I've told this story. So I have to, I can't be, I have to practice what you preach, right? So, so here I am. Um, I had a, a very normal childhood, just like Laura, loving parents, um, no adverse childhood um, issues. I was very happy in my family, a nice neighborhood. Um, the only thing about it was that I had a lot of imaginary friends. And um, my mother would come to have me say my prayers at night. I'd say them really fast so she'd get out of the room and I could talk to all my, my spirit friends who were in my room. Um, I also was a problem as I would, my father would go to have, sit down at the dining room table and he'd be sitting on them and I would cause qu quite a scene um, since he was sitting on my friends until he finally convinced me they did not exist and things got better. Um, I graduated from college, overachiever, worked in finance in New York. Um, through my business circles, I met my first husband, um, who was also an overachiever, and unfortunately, he suffered from mental illness and committed suicide when I was 28 years old. Um, my second husband was from here in Arizona, and he was from El Salvador. And um, my first real traumatic event was our second date. And um, he took me on a hot air balloon in North Phoenix. And the balloon crashed into um, electrical wires, and we threw out the electricity to 250,000 people. <laughs> and then newspapers came and everything. It was really exciting. Or, at least I have a documented version of our second date. <laughs> um, and then at that time, he uh, con convinced me to move to El Salvador. And at that time, there was a civil war going on. So that was interesting. Um, I did. I started a food and wine business and was from extended from Panama to Mexico. I was madly in love and happy living in a war zone. Um, the drawback was that um, there was a lot of trauma associated with that. I, I have to write down all the things that happened because I can't even remember them. But I was thrown out of a yacht um, when I was fishing. I almost drowned. Hit by a freak wave. Um, also almost drowned. Something about the ocean. I, I bought a house on a lake after that. Um, <clears throat> I was ambushed by gorillas with AK-47s when we were going to our farm. A bomb went off in a car near uh, I was, my car when I was getting in. I was blown into my back seat. Um, I volunteered, this was crazy, what was I thinking? I volunteered at the, at the Veterans Hospital so I could see all the massive injuries and have all this trauma on top of that. Um, my house was attacked during a, a civil unrest. Uh, my businesses, people were assassinated. The, in fact, the, the U.S. Marines were in my business at the time, and they were like, what should we do, what should we do? And I'm like, you're the Marines, you guys are supposed to know, you know what to do here. They were all lying on the floor. Um, I had a stalker for six months and a bodyguard with an M16 in my back seat. Um, I was more recently extortioned. Uh, my bank account was compromised. And I think one of the longest <clears throat> was being a caregiver to my second husband, who had diabetes and little by little had amputations of his toes and then finally his um, feet and then um, he ended up dying in my arms. And so that was, that was my lasagna. I call that my lasagna of trauma. Layers and layers and layers on top of layers. I did my best to live alone um, in, on 80 acres in a uh, volcanic lake in El Salvador. Um, I didn't have very many neighbors around, but I did have a staff there. Um, and when I, after his death, I started to have a, an experience, a barrage of psychic phenomenon. Um, there were coincidental rainbows. Um, I started to hear drumming. Um, there were snakes, lots of snakes that I had not experienced before. And one, one day was especially odd. Um, I was with my, my housekeepers. And um, I was standing outside, and a, a rain cloud formed um, above me and rained on me. And of course, my, I, I thought I was crazy, but when they told me they saw it too, I said, okay, there's something to this. Um, that same evening, which was actually five years ago today, um, I was, <clears throat> there was a lightning storm on the property that day, and in that evening, um, I was um, out, I was um, beginning to hear voices. I walked out to the end of the point near the lake and I was hit by light. 
a light beam. Um, I was um, unconscious for three hours. I do not know where I was. Um, but when I came to, um, I realized that I had completely different perception of the world. I was also paralyzed. I, um, I, I now know that that was astral um, catalepsy, which occurs when someone's been out of their, has left their body. Um, and in, in a, a sus subsequent experience, I also had light that also came into my bedroom and entered me as well, and had another of what would be seven out-of-body experiences. Um, obviously, if you've been out of your body that much, it's very hard to come back and, um, and be you know, connected to who you are. Um, I could also hear, see, and feel spirits um, around me. Oddly, um, I had a knowledge of shamanic work, which I had no idea of. I was never involved in New Age thinking. I had no idea of these things. I also um, had a strange knowledge of the Mayan language, an ancient wisdom language, which um, was also very strange. Um, and so I, I believe what happened to me is, I'm trying to label things today, um, um, they put, I found out that they called this a spiritual emergency. And it is probably one of the darkest and most dangerous processes that someone can go through. Um, I had what they call kundalini activation, spirit possession, near-death experiences, out of seven out-of-body experiences, shamanic initiation, death and rebirth, and I think the only thing that didn't happen was I was not visited by a UFO. <laughs> <clears throat> Although I still don't know where I was for three hours. Um, so doing my best to live in this ordinary life um, after this extraordinary experience was um, very difficult. I had problems with electronics. Um, one morning I threw every single electronic in my house into the swimming pool. The only thing that was there was the big screen TV because I couldn't lift it. Um, and um, you know, I had really no template um, available for these experiences. So I went to, I, I decided to leave, I went to the States and I called a friend and I, I got to her house in Texas and I explained the whole thing and as you know, her, her throat is, her chin is down here. I said, what do I do? I said, you know, I've always gone to the Mayo Clinic when I've had problems. In Arizona, I'm thinking of going there, and she's like, Lori, you are not going to the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> and um, so she said, why don't you just go to a spa for a couple weeks, you know, relax, you know, things are probably going to be okay. So I did go to a spa. Unfortunately, I could not stop the voices. Uh, it was just terrifying. And I, like Laura, I, because I couldn't deal with it, I um, got in my car and decided to kill myself. Um, luckily, um, I had some divine intervention at that time. I'm obviously here. And um, I, um, in trying to avoid medical, the Western medical framework, um, because they, she was so afraid that if I would go to a therapist, that they would put me in a mental hospital. So this was, this was me trying to find some way out of the system. So then she says, well, I've got these friends who have these shamans in Colombia, so maybe you should go down there. So I'm like, I'll go anywhere. And I spoke Spanish. So I wasn't intimidated by that. So I spent two weeks with these guys in the, near the Amazon in Colombia. And they did do a lot of um, help in stopping the voices, but they were still a little concerned. They had never seen someone so fragmented as I was at that time. So back in the US, my mind um, could still not understand the, the eradication of really all my beliefs. Um, I, for example, I, I would go get a pedicure and the, the gentleman who was giving me the pedicure was from Cambodia. And all I could see were landmines. And for three days, I thought I was going to step on a landmine. So this, I could, it was very hard to go out in the world. Um, and I ended up uh, eventually in a mental hospital in Tucson, Arizona. Um, while I was there, I saw spirits attached to a lot of the patients. I could smell the drugs, I could see the problems that they had, I could see into the to human body, which that was kind of odd, um, not being able to have done that before. Um, and I felt that I had some kind of knowledge to heal them. So I started healing people, they were getting out, and um, you know everything was kind of odd and strange. Um, the food was very strange, because I, I could only see colors, I could not see the food. Because um, I, I was seeing past a certain level of, um, of, of, of dimensional level. Um, 
The second incident, um, I was um, unresponsive in my backyard. I had had another out-of-body experience. My neighbor called 911. The paramedics were trying to revive me, and I was sitting in my backyard watching them. And I decided I'd jump back in. So I jumped back in my body. They took me off to the hospital, and I said, I don't want to go anywhere. I need an MRI because I need a big, fat tumor on my brain to explain everything that is going on here. And they did the, the MRI. I was perfectly normal. So I got sent off to the mental hospital again. Um, I was there <clears throat> for um, some time. I, I, had, I was diagnosed with borderline schizophrenia, bipolar, severe PTSD, depression, psychic break, on and on and on, you know, same, same thing. Um, they did um, give me prescription drugs, and um, I had extraordinarily high levels of lithium in my system. When they told me about lithium, I was like, where have I heard that word before? And I thought, batteries, lithium, batteries. I'm thinking, why are they putting battery stuff inside of me? So that's when I decided I had to escape. And so I, um, I had a friend of mine, with a girl that I'd met there, she was going to rehab in, in Malibu, California. So I said, I'm going where she's going, because you know these people are putting battery stuff in me. So I took off with her. Um, we went to a, um, a, a very posh rehab in Malibu. I had to sign all these releases, because there were all these movie stars and rock stars living there, and I wasn't supposed to tell the, the tabloids that I was there. They were all addicted to prescription drugs. And so I learned about all the drugs. I didn't even know that existed, Ambien, all these things. Um, and I just hung out there just because I was happy to have a place to be safe. I, I Like you were saying, I just, just to have a place where someone was looking over me was wonderful. Um, I went back to Scottsdale. Um, I did some outpatient therapy. I was telling my psychiatrist what was going to happen in the future. And of course, things were happening. So he's like, well, that's crazy. She knows what's going to happen. He says, you know, I, he said, I, I really think that you need to seek a spiritual um, path here because this is, this is not adding up. Um, I, too, tried to avoid taking medications. I was crazier on med medications. Um, and when I realized that the uh, traditional psychiatry was not going to work for me, I said to him, you know, what do I do? Who do I call? And he said, this is crack, this is crack, man. He says, Call Deepak Chopra. <laughs> so I said, really? And he's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta go out in that, into that world and find what's going on. So I did call Deepak Chopra, <laughs> but he wasn't there. He was busy that day. Um, so she, um, so I, I they, the girl I talked to, she says, well, you know, there's, there's a, some, a girl who lives in Sedona. She's um, worked with him. Maybe call her. So I, I called Sarah McLean. A lot of you might know Sarah. Um, and went to her house and she talk, talked to me about meditation and told me that I should start meditating. Um, and then at that time I had told her about all this Mayan stuff and they said, oh, then you need to talk to a shaman. So I had all these different people lined up that I was talking to. Um, I, I was fascinated because for the first time in this whole experience, I told somebody what happened and they got it. They got it, they knew. They had had these experiences themselves. And I said, whoa, I found my peeps here. And I really realized that what I had been going through was a spiritual awakening. Um, so I became very fascinated with this. I, um, I went to, to see all kinds of options of uh, spiritual healing practices. I went um, to Peru, to Bali, to, I, I took courses, every course I could find about these um, things to find out kind of what I had known that I had inherited and also how I could help myself. Uh, and at the time I realized how, how unconventional this approach was. You know, nobody wanted to talk about it. I didn't know where to go. I was very lucky I had the resources to go and try different things and figure it out. You know, most people don't have um, insurance to cover what I did and so they don't have this option available to them. So I was very luck lucky. Of course, after all this had happened, the last thing I was going to listen to was someone telling me that my serotonin levels were off. Um, that wasn't going to work for me. So my key to recovery um, was understanding that I needed a mentor. I needed people who understood what was going on. Um, I had um, a, a very famous psychic um, work with me. I had another woman who, who was third generation um, shaman, shamanic teacher. 
Her grandmother was a shaman um, in um, Haiti for um, three generations. Um, they took me under their wing. I had other people come in and work with me. And I, I used to ask them, I said, you know, how do I ever repay you for this? And they said, you just got it. You just have to help other people going forward. Um, I realized that my mind was like a wild horse that I needed to, um, to, to tame it, to manage it. So I did that through meditation. I also cleaned up my body. I did major detoxing. Um, I did therapeutic massage, removing, um, um, removing some of the trauma out of the cellular environment. Um, I tried literally everything. I even had a Navajo healer show, literally show up unexpectedly, put me on his Navajo rug and say, said, I'm gonna help you. Um, he, and I looked for him online, he, he, you can't Google him. Um, so um, I had a, um, you know, I got a lot of information. I went up through um, yoga. Um, I had a whole different relationship with nature um, that I didn't have before. And I began to have an open dialogue with the voices, and I had a sense of what was positive and what was negative, and I realized that I had faith in, in what I was hearing, and I was not, and I just, and I got to the point where I said, I'm not crazy. Um, I started researching, I'm an avid researcher, so I wanted to understand the historical part of this, and um, I, I started reading about um, indigenous cultures, and I realized that a, a lot of these people in these cultures had been hit by light. Um, a lot of them by lightning. Some of them had been um, actually, um, you know, they've lost their ears and things like that. And in these cultures, um, when someone like that had had those experiences, they were embraced by the community. They were brought in and they were said, you know, they said, yay, we've got our seer, our healer. We've got someone who can communicate with the spiritual world. And they were embraced and taught by, by other sages and, and mentors and really brought into the, to the tribe. They were, they were revered. Um, and I thought, well, that's interesting because you know, very, very a lot of parallels to what had happened to me. Um, I also thought it was interesting, some other study that I had looked at was um, they, they, inter they studied people who had had um, mental illness. And they said after they've had the, these experiences, that 75% of them are spiritual. They have a spiritual thing. So I think there's a, there's a huge um, link between that. Um, and I, I continue to study that more and more. Um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting um, that the, the Greek word for psyche is butterfly. Um, and it's, the, it's uh, in which we further define as our soul, you know, our mind, our spirit. And, and the butterfly is the symbol for spiritual transformation. And when the butterfly emerges, of course, our consciousness is born. And many cultures see butterflies as transformation. But unfortunately, the mental health profession has lost its focus on the entire root of the word of its profession. And I think there's something fundamentally wrong that we define men mental illness separate from the psyche, which is the soul of the person. And the, the famous manual that, that um, Bob talked about today has a little bit of reference to spiritual awakening, but not enough. Um, it's very vague, and it's not near, near, does not nearly cover what happened to me. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting that they were asking me what was wrong. Um, you know, what, what, is your, what, what's, what are you feeling? And through a, a person who's completely delusional, they're trying to figure out how I fit into this book. Um, I remember... As soon as I said that I heard voices, the word schizophrenia was walk, they wrote across my paper. And I knew that was a probably not a good thing, especially because the spirits were going, no, no. Um, and so um, they said, do you hear voices um, all the time? And I said, yeah, but when I'm listening to my iPod. <laughs> and so they said, is it always when you're listening to your iPod that you hear voices and trying to get out of the system? I said, yes. So I got the schizophrenia, and I, then it was only borderline <laughs> schizophrenia because they weren't sure if it, maybe the iPod was off. <laughs> but um, the, the problem really um, with my situation was there was a, a tremendous misdiagnosis of what was wrong with me. 
there was a fear of seeking treatment. Um, the first thing we, you know, that happened was, oh my God, don't go to the mayor, don't go to a psychiatrist, they'll throw you into a, an institution. And then the inadequate research about really what happens when someone is having a spiritual awakening. So not understanding this was a huge barrier for me to get the proper help that I needed. Um, now I feel it is the greatest gift that I had. Um, I cannot I cannot think of my life without that experience. Um, I I do hear voices all the time, but I do I have I manage them. I only listen to benevolent and loving voices, and and I help others with that. Um, and I also have a tribe, um, people who of wiser mentors, people who've been through it before, who are, who are always available to me when I need to pick up the phone. Um, I do not take any drugs. Um, I just um, go out in nature. I learn to manage the mind. Um, and I, right now, I uh, have started a practice here in Sedona, and I help people who've been to, through similar experiences to mine when they don't have a definition for what's happening. Um, I, since I have invested a lot of money and time in navigating the system, I feel that I have a, um, I call myself a concierge to this world um, of finding an alternative to using meds and helping others get off of them. So thank you very much for listening to the story.